Hey, welcome everyone to another weekly edition of the Story Trading Weekly Meetup. Before we get started, a quick disclaimer, Story Trading or our guests are not investment advisors. Investing in securities involves significant risk of loss. This event is being recorded, will be provided first to our VIP members over the next seven days and then uh, posted on our social media accounts. For those of you who are new here, what's in a story trade? Story trading and a story trade is a practice of understanding market pricing through the lens of the four pillars of fundamentals, catalyst, sentiment, and technicals. Uh, we now do that through crowdsourced research and social collaboration in our WhatsApp community and on Zoom. We do have an app that where it's in private beta right now, which is the place to discover, collaborate, and validate market moving information. So make sure to sign up for a private beta at our website and we'll slowly onboard people in over the next few months. Um, and you can track our VIP picks. Uh, the presentation we have tonight will be tracked as a VIP pick. Uh, you can go to that link there. I'll give you a Google spreadsheet. We've been dramatically outperforming the market since we've been tracking these VIP picks. Now, since AIR, AHR went up like a thousand percent in four months, we've been inundated with new idea requests. So we are doing lots of changing around here at Story Trading with my new colleague, Jared Plotkin, to help streamline the new idea process. We have a new room on WhatsApp for new ideas. We have a completely new process that we're going to hopefully reveal here in the next few days, which will spark conversation and really get that crowdsource collaboration going on some of the top picks we have that may become the next VIP pick. So now that we have lots of ideas coming in, we can even get better VIP picks. So really excited about that. So tonight, there's been a lot of hype and interest over the metaverse. And uh, Mr. Facebook over there, uh, uh, changing the name of his company, from Mark Zuckerberg, from Facebook to Meta, M-E-T-A. So there was some uh, chatter in our community about a few stocks, particularly Matterport, M-T-T-R. So uh, Akil volunteered from our community to present this stock. Uh, NASDAQ last closed $22.17. And if we can give over the permissions to Akil, actually, I don't see him all of a sudden. I thought I saw him before. Do you see him there, Jared? Where is he? There he is, Akil. All right. So, Akil, I am going to make you a co host so you can have all the permissions you need. Um, quickly, here is the chart on Matterport. MTTR, you can see this big green candle spike was on Facebook, switched to, to Meta. And then they had earnings a few days later. It went down on earnings. That's the story of that red candle there. So we're going to be looking at this presentation from Akil and trying to understand the fundamental sentiment catalysts and technicals to help us understand the past pri uh, pri uh, price action on this stock better and make better informed trade and investment decisions. So Akil, I will turn it over to you. All, all right. Thank you, Ben. Yep. So, hello, everyone. How do, do I share my screen or how does it work? Uh, yeah, you should have a button there. I think it's a green button to the right of chat where it says share screen. You should have permission to do that right now. Okay. Just give me a second. Let me... All right, there it is. Akil, we got your uh, PowerPoint up. Uh, you can go ahead with your presentation. Okay. Hey, everyone. My name is Akhil. And uh, I uh, got into investing uh, to about two years back. So I'm not a professional financial advisor. Just wanted to make sure that these are my views about Matterport. I have been long Matterport for about I think eight to nine months since it was launched as a SPAC. So just wanted to let you know this information. Uh, knowing I, nothing in this document is uh, constitutes an investment advice and I'm not a financial advisor, okay? So what is Matterport, okay? Uh, now Matterport, there is a, 
I've written here, Matterport is leading the digitization and datafication of the built world. So basically, when you go to Redfin or any other website nowadays, you see something called a 3D visual tour. Okay, let me probably just play this video so that you have it. I can. Yeah, the audio doesn't work, um, but that's okay. You can share audio. When you do share screen, there's a, a checkbox you got to hit to share audio. So you may have missed that, but. but. Got it. So just wanted so to talk, give an idea about what. It. Yeah, just wanted to give an idea about what Matterport does. It's so if you see this video that is being shared, uh, you go to any Matterport basically is able to convert any any space into a 3D spatial uh, space as per them, right? So if you see all of this, it's able to, you know, uh, you, you can actually virtually go and see every single space that they capture with the help of their technology, which they say is one of the most advanced uh, in its field, right? So this is what uh, Matterport does. Let me just go back to my presentation. Hope you got some idea. I'm going to share all of these links with the, the whole community later on. But basically, you are able to, instead of having videos, you are able to just, you know, navigate and see 3D environment using Metaport's technology, which they say Cortex, right? And it's powered by AI and machine driven. So it gets better with every image or every video that they take right and they are probably the first mover in this space there are a couple of companies who have entered this space in the last few years uh, but they have like a pretty good solid uh, you know 10 years of science and research behind it okay so this is what matterport does now my investment thesis is based on a couple of things right uh, this is a huge market, right? As per the Matterport investor presentation, this market is anywhere between 240 billion to 1.2 trillion, right? Just the digitization of the spaces, of physical spaces is, is at a very, very early stage right now. Uh, we hardly see it. And uh, <clears throat> so it's a huge market. Uh, the company is growing pretty tremendously. It has seen about 50% uh, revenue growth in the last couple of years. Uh, they, are, they have like really good margins, uh, about 50% plus, right? So it, it's basically, you know, it, trades as, it, it should be trading as a software multiple. Uh, they have partnership with enterprise customers. Uh, <clears throat> already they have, the, I've, I've just mentioned below, they, some of the existing customers they have is Cushman, Wakefield, Redfin, etc. So if you have ever been to, and uh, uh, I can actually show what's, if I have time at the end of uh, you know this presentation, I can show you a virtual tour by Redfin and it's powered by Metaport. So you can actually just, you know, it almost looks like as if you are really getting into the house yourself, but it, it it's powered by Metaport, right? So it's having these, all these uh, existing customers and uh, relationships. Uh, interestingly, it has also part Facebook, it has partnered with Facebook on research for research and academic purpose, uh, creating one of the biggest digital libraries in the world. Uh, Cornell and Carnegie Mellon have actually have already started using uh, its, uh, its repository. It's present in 150 plus countries and expanding a lot of job openings on their careers page. I'll be, I'll be sharing some numbers at the end of the presentation. And finally, I think you know, I also thought that given its size, it's about a $5 billion company. It, it, it's like peanuts for companies like uh, uh, Facebook, Unity or Roblox, which are you know, 1 trillion or 100 billion in uh, 100 billion, 50 billion types in, in, in market cap. So this could be a potential acquisition target as well in the near future. So this is my investment thesis, some of the things that I thought of. 
Uh, any questions here before I move on to the next slide? I, I'm good. You're doing a great job. Let's uh, we'll save the questions for the end. Okay. So, up till a couple of years back, actually, Matterport, you know, used to sell these physical three cameras. Uh, these are like three thousand to ten thousand dollar cameras, and you could, you know, professional photographers would go and take photos of the house and uh, process it using Meta Metaport's software and create these spatial uh, designs. But recently in the last couple of years, I think that they brought in a new CEO whom I'm also going to talk about and they have started uh, adapting themselves and selling them their uh, soft, selling their product as a software, as a, as a service now. So basically, you can download their, you either you can take their camera or you can download their app on iPhone or Android. And you can actually start creating these spatial spaces yourself and they charge a monthly fees for it, right? So uh, subscription-based fees. And so now their whole business model is adapting to software as a service. So this, so now, <clears throat> And I feel, and, and that's why I think Metaport is now more of a software company than a hardware company. Even their revenues, etc., are showing this trend. They recently launched an Android app. Uh, their iPhone app already exists. It, it's got pretty 4.3 plus ratings across, you know, 900 plus reviews. So it's pretty pretty successful. Uh, Current majority of their customers are individuals, but they are focused on getting into the enterprise space. And in the last earnings call, even the uh, CEO, he mentioned this at least, you know, uh, a, a few, a couple of times at least uh, that their, their focus is getting into the enterprise space. So very excited about Matterport going, going forward. And their use cases, in fact, are also going to, uh, as per the CEO, going to be expanded. So right now they are only focused, and um, most majority of it is focused by real estate, hotels, et cetera. But uh, there's an interview that I share on YouTube that uh, the CEO gave with Jonah Lupton and where he talks about use cases such as, you know, uh, uh, managers at Target using Matterport, right? Spatial spaces. So if you are an operations manager at Target, just using basically the space uh, on the cloud, the repository, you are able to see how their aisles look, what are the type of uh, you know things they have on aisles, how should it look, look and feel, etc. And design some design uh, without even being at the without even being at target, uh, something like that, right? Airbnb, etc. You know, uh, you using it for listing of their showings, their high, their properties, commercial properties, uh, using Matterport to actually, uh, you know, make sure and, and design their spaces, design more energy efficient designs, et cetera. He also talks about one particular example, which I thought was interesting, you know, using their data analytics, you can actually just determine if everyone is using Metaport, let's say in London, how many buildings in London, how many apartments in London are east facing, how many windows are east facing, what is the energy efficiency, what's the, uh, you know, sunlight they bring in, et cetera, et cetera. So he talks about a, a ton of different cases. I don't know, uh, you know, how much of it is going to be true, but at least there seems to be some legit use cases with, uh, of this technology in the future. Uh, sorry, I'm going a little bit too fast. Uh, maybe, uh, any you're questions? Good. You're good. You're good. Uh, okay. So, so these are some of the financials. Uh, this is on a yearly basis. So if you see their revenue is broken down into four different revenue streams, right? So there is a subscription revenue, which is, which I said, they're moving into more of a subscription revenue model. Right, so 2019 it was 24.5 million. Uh, 2020 it was 41 million, and the, in the first half of 2021 it was 29 million. Right, so they have been increased. The subscription revenue is increasing pretty substantially. This is the product revenue. This is revenue from their selling their cameras. So although it is increasing, uh, this is 
I mean, maybe, you know, 15 to 20 percent margin business, hardware businesses is, is a hard business too. We all know that, right? And it's not a recurring business. So not much focus is there. The license revenue uh, and the services, they provide some services as well. So companies, big companies, if they are, you know, not if they do not know how to use the, their cameras, et cetera, they, are, they provide some services. So a little bit of revenue comes from there as well. And licenses used based on, you know, the, the software that they sell. Again, this is, they are moving away from these uh, business lines. So the thing to focus is very, uh, you know, subscription, they're moving into a SaaS business. Uh, so more of recurring revenue in the, in the future. So that's where I wanted to focus on. Um, their gross margins are around, if you see here, gross margins on the subscription are about, you know, 70 odd percent. So very high margin business, license, et cetera, nothing to talk about. And this is the hardware. They make 25 to 30% margins there. They do pay a lot of cost in sales and marketing and R&D. So in fact, in the latest report, which I'm going to, you know, let me actually just share. These are the, some key financial data that I downloaded uh, on a quarterly basis. So this is their overall margin. If you see the trend is in an upward direction, uh, just in the last quarter though, their, their year over year growth was a little bit slow and that's why the stock actually fell a little bit after the earnings. Uh, and a big reason, and there is also that R&D, et cetera, costs have also increased substantially in the last year. Now, my thesis is this is because of the various initiatives they are taking in uh, developing their Android app and uh, other, the SaaS-based model that they are moving into. But the CEO did point out in the earnings that they are on for FI22, they are expecting a 50% plus revenue growth compared to FY21. So just some things to you know, take note of. No debt on their balance sheet, which is great, and about 400 odd million, uh, 350 odd million cash they have on their balance sheet. So this is from a financial point of view. Okay, great. Okay. Talking about valuation, uh, it's trading at a pretty rich valuation actually. Uh, so the market cap of company as of Friday is 5.3 billion. It's trade stock price is trading at a price of $22 and 17 cents. Uh, it is, it does not have positive earnings yet. A lot of these high growth SaaS companies, they are, they trade on, you know, market, the TAM and price to sales multiple, et cetera. So it's currently trading at a price to sales multiple of 52, which is pretty rich, right? Like this is in the range of, if I have just shared a table here, for example, you know, uh, Cloudflare, Snowflake, Build.com, Asana, these are all trading at really rich, uh, you know, price to sales multiples. The revenue growth for all of them is again, you know, uh, you, you can see from 30, 40% to 100%. So really high growth companies with really high margins. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, just wanted to give a picture that Matterport is trading at a very similar kind of valuations compared to these high growth uh, companies. So uh, just you know, uh, make a note of that. The dollar, one thing I wanted to talk about was dollar based expansion. So a lot of software companies, they really focus on this number, which is this number is basically explains how much is the, is currently the, the customer that you have is paying compared to last year. So on average, their customers are paying actually 120% of what they were paying last year. That means if they were spending $100 with Matterport last year, this year they are spending $120. So you want to, you want that figure to be always above 100 for these SaaS companies. You never want it to go down. When you see this dollar rate net expansion figure go down for a company, that's a really big red flag. And uh, in fact, uh, so so that's a pretty good you know number to to see that 
majority of their customers are actually expanding their businesses with Matterport. So they are able to sell, upsell more things to their customers. Okay. Saying this, I just did a quick simulation where I put 12 months. I project, sorry for this, you know, poor. Uh, 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 it's very, it was very, it, I added this last minute. So apologies for that. But basically what this tells is on this side, I have the revenue projection growing by 30%, 40% and 50%. Okay. For next year. And on this side, I have the price to sales multiple for Matterport. So this is, if it trades at 20, if it trades at 30, if it trades at 40, if it trades at 50, right. And right now, we are somewhere here 5.3 billion right so we are so let's say in the worst case scenario the revenue grows at only 20 percent and 30 percent and its price to sales multiples drop substantially the stock would be cut in half right almost half so it from 5.2 billion it would go down to 2.7 billion so i I consider this as worst case scenario right if it does, if our, uh, you know, if it keeps growing at 50%, then, you know, and the price by sales multiple continue to be at 50, right? Then we have looking at about a 50% plus upside in the next year itself, maybe more, you know, more than 50%. So this is about 8 billion of market cap that we are looking at next year. So these are just some numbers for you to see how the actually the market cap can change according to different scenarios. So this was a little bit complex. So just wanted to make sure if everyone understands this. Yeah, <clears throat> looks good, thanks. Okay. Uh, and the one more thing I did want to talk about was in any high growth company that you know I have read and who, which has done well, the founders and management team play a really important role. Uh, so the current CEO of uh, Matterport, his name is RJ Pittman, very, very distinguished guy. He's held, he was the SVP of product at eBay, uh, pretty high executive at Google and head of e-commerce business at Apple before he joined Matterport. So really good credentials. Um, you know, he, I think he knows his stuff. I think he, he's the guy who has actually turned around the business as a software, as a service compared to a lot of, you know, product that they were uh, doing earlier. Uh, these are the two co-founders, David Gosback and Matt Bell. So Matt Bell, he founded Matterport. He's, he's a Stanford and, you know, he was, this was a Y Combinator uh, company. Uh, really good i mean we've read really good things about him but he left the company in 2017 uh, over differences so just a little bit of i would say uh you know flag that we should be aware of that the initial but david gosback is still there he's the chief scientist and co-founder at matterport uh again you know really good credentials this guy has some of the other stuff I look into is, you know, how much percentage is uh, by in insiders. Now, I may have to double check this, but this is from Yahoo and 8.5% uh, of stocks are held by insiders and 23% of stocks are held by institutions. But so this is something else to consider as well. I would have ideally liked to see a little bit more by the insiders. Uh, we'll see if this number is correct. So I'll get back and update this presentation. The risks that I see are, you know, it's trading at a pretty rich valuation, 50 price to sales. Competition has heating at a bit, little bit. Zillow has developed its own 3D software and a few more companies have come up. I read, I read reviews of a lot of those companies online on YouTube. None of them actually are at a scale that matter as at, at a technology that matter that similar that to Matterport, but you know you you still want to be aware of your competition. So uh, some some risks to be aware of, right? Some links that I provide, 
I would say, you know, this interview with the CEO, really good interview, gives some insight into his vision, etc. And then there are some other interviews, things that I've shared. Uh, and then coming to the four pillars of story trading, I also made some notes of that. Should I just go with this pen or? Yeah, my favorite part. Let's go for it. Okay. <laughs> so I already talked about the fundamentals. Uh, let's some look at the catalyst. <clears throat> so, re so recently I did say, uh, mention that they announced uh, their partnership with Facebook or Meta. And he mentioned it a couple of times in the earnings call as well. So not too much details given in the earning call, unfortunately, uh, but hopefully in the next few months, we hear a little bit more about this. We already know that they are, they are collaborating on research stuff uh, and which is already being used by uh, Carnegie Mellon and, and Cornell universities, right? Expanding into enterprise pass as space, uh, mentioned a lot by the CEO, it's their focus for the next year. Uh, they got some, they got their first public account in the last quarter. So that's another, I think, space that, that could be really interesting for them. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> and uh, they actually launched a Matterport Android app last month. It's, uh, it's, it's actually this month. So it's only about 14 days. It has got about 200 odd reviews. I looked up on Google Play. So not, not too many. And there have been some complaints, but hopefully they are going to you know, fix it because their, uh, uh, their app on app, app and an Apple iStore uh, is, is pretty awesome. The reviews are great and it's about 4.5 rated there. So they also mentioned that when they launched their uh, uh, their app on Apple a couple of years back, their subscribers grew as much in, in like a couple of months, as much as the, their number in eight years. So, you know, a significant improvement in the number of subscribers with the app. So imagine but, with, with, the, with the Android app, what, this, what would happen? When, when you say last month, do you mean October or do you mean September? Uh, uh, it, uh, October. End October. Of October. So all of that, all of that growth wasn't actually included in the most recent quarterly report. So Android app was just launched. There was nothing that was reported for the Android app in the quarter. No. Okay, that's great. Yeah. So these are some of the catalysts that I see in the near future. From a sentiment point of view. Uh, if you, if you just search Matterport, it's covered a lot on many articles on Motley Fool Seeking Alpha. It's about 11K followers on StockWits. And I, I don't give too much of attention to StockWits, but some people do. So wanted to mention. This quarter, their earnings wasn't very exciting though. They only 10% uh, year over year growth. However, the company you know, is mm -hmm. trying to change the business model, but the stock did not fell a lot. That is something to be aware of. Like normally if a stock, which is trading at a 50 price to sales multiple, only 10% growth in this market, it would be butchered by 40 odd percent, 30%. You see, you saw upstart last week, they reported 100, uh, 250 per plus percent plus growth. And their stock was down by 25% or so. So, you know, stock did not go down. That tells a lot about maybe their future. Uh, also wanted to talk about their job opening. So, you know, LinkedIn shows they have about 500 odd employees and about 150 positions open. And the CEO mentioned that they have been wanting to hire people, but uh, it has just been very hard to find like good people. So this is a very bullish sentiment as well that I see, you know, if a company is hiring close to maybe 25, 30% of people of their current workforce that does show, you know, how much they are wanting to expand from a growth point of view. So, uh, you know, a sentiment is a little mixed. So uh, actually, if, if I can <laughs> stop you, go back to sentiment. Uh, <clears throat> this is, you know, one of the, uh, in a way, most important pillars at, at story trading. But 
you know, I, I think sentiment could be a very real thing. It, it's, um, you know, has a lot to do with, with people's future expectations of the sector, a lot to do with that, right? Uh, what's the world look like? When he went back and he talked about TAM, right? There's a lot of excitement right now with Facebook switching their, you know, ticker simple and to meta and, and focus, focus on metaverse. So I think, you know, one of the things we need to find out in, in regards to sentiment is just how big does, you know, average investor out there think this space is and, and how much, and, and just how much of that market do they think Matterport is going to grab, right? And, and I think that's the key thing about sentiment that, you know, I try to gauge at least when I'm looking at social media and I'm talking to other investors, trying to gauge <laughs> where they are on that because that will very much drive either premiums or discounts uh, compared to the fundamental value will very, very much be driven by that. Um, so I, you know, I wonder just, we're going to take questions at the end, but maybe if you can interject a little bit on your thoughts in, in terms of how important is this Facebook move into the space and, and what does the average person think out there? Is this, you know, what kind of TAM, what, what kind of TAM is this and what percent of that TAM is Matterport going to get? And that could kind of really dictate what the future market cap looks like 10, 15 years from now and give you a little insight into why the stock is so overvalued, quote unquote, overvalued right now. Yeah, so so to be honest, I don't think the average investor knows a lot about this space. Uh, it's, they know, you know, <clears throat> even, um, you know, this metaverse, this, this, this thing is very, very new to all of us, right? And we are still trying to figure out this virtual, metaverse space that uh, that 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 maybe is going to exist in the next couple of years or decades as per Mr. Zuckerberg, right? But what I think that, you know, the average investor knows about, you know, this that this product is, is really good. If they go and look over some videos of, uh, of, of uh, Matterport, you'll be stunned to see the quality of the, the product. The design, it's it's just very eye opening, right? They have they have, they have tried to you know uh, design 3D space of I think the the Colosseum in, uh, in 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 Greece is it where the gladiator fights took place, and, and it just looks unreal, right? That that is the kind of quality that you are looking for. So I would say that the, just the product is very superior. It's very high end. Uh, yeah, that's important too. I failed to mention that, right? The the sentiment about the product, and you know, that's also a function of, you know, how much of this uh, market cap, uh, how much of the total adjustable market can they get, right? When people think they the product is really strong, and and also can speak to what other potential businesses, uh, ancillary businesses, that can the company get into based on the quality of their current product. So. You know, all of that does go into sentiment. And, um, you know, I think the market is telling us that sentiment is very high. And, and the question is why, right? But we know it's very high just because the, again, the premium over the fundamental value is extraordinary. So that obviously right. speaks to the sentiment that, like you're saying, the quality, the product of the quality, the, the quality of the product is really good. The TAM is really big, probably an expectation that they get a big portion of that TAM. Maybe they're imagining they go into other businesses. So I, I think this is something, you know, with the community, we'll, you know, do a little more collaboration on. So we kind of get our finger on the pulse of, of what the market's saying about the sentiment. Right. And what I would ideally want to maybe get into is maybe talk to a few people who have actually, who are into real estate and see how they have, whether they have used this or not. Right. not just, uh, not just, I've seen a lot of reviews, which are really positive, but just talking to a real guy who has used this product really makes a it makes a big difference right and uh, i've watched like three or four interviews of the ceo he talks about getting into these different revenue streams now as with any you know one of these saas companies a lot of it is baked into this price the, the probably you know if they fail to deliver this prob the stock is going to cut in half easily yeah. oh absolutely that's that's right. how that's how it always is with these ghost <laughs> companies. Yeah, it's always like that. And if you get into a bear market or 
or exactly. uh, you know volatile market, it's not going to be fun for the short term. But a lot of times, you know, the the wisdom of the crowd is right, and you know we'll look back five, ten years from now, or even three years from now, and you'll see a market cap ten times as high. It's very possible as well with these growth companies. So. Uh, I know there's a question in the chat, but let's let's actually finish up your presentation and then we'll take the questions. Uh, right. So this is the technical analysis. I'm not a very big chart person, uh, but you know this was launched as a SPAC. Really, really high uh, excitement around the Feb time for it. Reached about 23, and uh, I was like, I have missed out on this. I didn't want to go in my hands here. So I was luckily, you know, it went down to like eleven, twelve dollars after the pipe, et cetera. And you know, slowly the volume has started increasing. So you see here for a long time there was very little volume. And now the volume picked up, uh, you know, with all these partnerships, et cetera, announced in the last couple of months with Facebook, a lot of talk about Roblox, they're moving to SaaS, et cetera, et cetera. So now it has almost, you know, really got back to its all-time high again. Uh, I mean, it was fairly, fairly overvalued like a year back when it was, right? So uh, it's still overvalued, but not insanely overvalued right now, right? Uh, so uh, I don't know how you interpret this chart, but it does seem to me that it found like pretty good support around the 14, 15 region, and now it's hovering about 22. Uh, these are my final thoughts. I think they their product is just extraordinarily good. Uh, you have to watch some videos and uh, actually, you know, see some of the Redfin tools and see the quality of their product. Like it, it's just breathtaking. You know, uh, they have some good partnerships on the real estate front and a lot of international expansion. However, the it is trading at a rich valuation. I got it. I was lucky. I got into it. The 11 now it's about 22. Personally, I just want to mention I would wait before I buy and get into a get a, a position into this. Maybe take a small position and wait for it to come down, or see the next quarterly report and see you know if they really generate numbers out of the box, 50, 60 percent year over year with huge guidance, then take a higher position. But these are these are my thoughts as of today. Cool, great. Thank you so much yeah. for that presentation, Akhil. Let's, uh, Jared, uh, any thoughts? What do you think of it? I know you you did some of your, uh, your own research on Matterport as well after that Facebook uh, catalyst. Uh, yeah, I think this is great. Um, th there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot going on here. Um, I think we're still kind of in the early stages of sentiment. Like, it's easy, I think, sometimes to get sucked into like the FinTwit world and say like, "Oh, well, Matterport's a stock everyone's talking about." No, not really. Like, it's not. It, it's being talked about by like people who are who do stock market stuff all day, but it's not. It hasn't really permeated even to the world of ETFs. Like, if you look at metaverse themed ETFs, Matterport isn't in most of them yet. Oh, wow. So. There's still opportunities for this thing to get bought into that. Most people still aren't really talking about how big the Facebook shift is. Like we're just in the first opening weeks of this. So I think that even though it seems like an overhyped company, from my perspective, if this metaverse thing is going to be a real thing, we're just in the beginning phases of the hype cycle. And that's before even considering the buzz of, um, you know, Facebook potentially buying this company or even just other people thinking Facebook will make an offer to buy this company and not creating a euphoria moment at some point in the future. I did not realize there's ETFs already focused on metaverse. Yeah, the fact that Matterport isn't in them, I was kind of astonished. Like I, I was upset when I first saw that. And then I realized I'm actually happy that that's the case because if they haven't bought it, that means that they're going to have to buy it later. And that's going to create really nice upward pressure. Um, one of the things that I think is easy to get um, when you have a company like this that's very richly valued, it's easy to say, oh, well, it's too highly valued. It might not be a good investment. I remember last year looking into a company called Livongo. Anybody remember that oh, one? Oh, gosh. Well, I know all about it because that's yeah. with Madrid. Uh, thesis, exactly. Thesis, yeah. now, <laughs> Livongo was extremely highly valued at every single moment. Like everyone was saying, it's too expensive. It's too expensive. It's too expensive. Wait for a pullback. And it just went up in a straight line. When I first meet, was aware of it, it was $60 and it went all the way up to $140 and then it got bought by Teladoc. And um, 
and yeah, that was it. There was never a time to buy it at a reasonable valuation. It just became expensive and got even more expensive and then got bought out. And I think that you could potentially be looking at something like that happening with Matterport. I'm not necessarily saying that that will happen um, soon, but I think that, like I said, given I think we're probably at the beginning of the hype cycle for this industry, I think you could potentially be looking at that at some point. And when you think about it, the I think the um, risk reward asymmetry is even more impressive than you explored in that chart because yes, the stock could fall by 50% within a year or two if this isn't successful. But yeah, with a total addressable market in the hundreds of billions of dollars, this thing really could potentially 10x in the next few years if this is able to achieve all the stuff that's talking about or if it's able to get a generous buyout from Facebook or something like that. So the risk is it doesn't work out and it has to fall by 50% because it was richly valued. But the reward, if things work out, is is pretty extraordinary. And I think the the fact that, as, as you mentioned earlier, the fact that it was able to rebound from the disappointing earnings so quickly shows that the institutional money is there to believe in the stock like that it's not being pushed up just by retail because retail didn't like those earnings it's being pushed up by the institutions yeah that's a that's a good point you know i didn't even know about i never even heard the term metaverse until facebook yeah people are just finding out about it now i mean like if, if we're just finding out about it now most people still don't know and that means that this has more room to get even more like in sentiment and whatever it could go up even further in terms mm. of the sentiment that's my yeah. perspective anyway. Cool. Thank, thanks for the tour there, Akil. That's great. We have a, a couple questions in chat from Matt. How did COVID impact the company with virtual house sales versus now you can view in person? So I wonder, did that have anything to do with the slower growth this past quarter? Uh, maybe last year they, they did really well with virtual? Akil, are you still there? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think they are moved. I, I don't think COVID played a role because this they already have this partnership with Redfin. And uh, of course, maybe their viewership with 3D tours went up by a lot. But I think 3D tours are the norm now. If you see on a lot of uh, tours on Redfin and Zillow, uh, most of the listings have this 3D tour. So I don't, I think it only accelerated their, uh, you know, their case, but what have I, I do think that the revenue has gone down because they're moving into more of a subscription based model compared to, you know, product model and licensing model that they had previously. Uh, um, that is the only reason that the, the, that comes up and the CEO even, you know, mentions that in the earnings call. But apart from that, uh, nothing really regarding that, anything else. I think they had mentioned in the call that one of the problems was they couldn't get enough computer chips for their digital camera offerings or something like that because of the chip shortage. That Yep, yep. But, and and that, again, that seems the, like a temporary problem. That does seem like a temporary problem. Uh, plus, they're also moving away from this model, uh, you know, the selling cameras, et cetera, right? They're whatever the product revenue we see is only increasing 20%. So it's only there for the high-end photographers. But for people who like us or, you know, enterprises, even if they really want to train people on, on just selling their product or with whatever camera that they are using, right? Even the iPhone, et cetera. But just generating revenue on a, uh, <clears throat> on a regular basis instead of selling one-time license fees. So that's what their focus is. Okay, and he answered pretty much the next question of is the revenue down because of the change in the business model? So, uh, right, yeah, that's that's what the that that's what was mentioned a lot in the earnings call as well. So mm -hmm. we'll have to. I think I'll I'll be paying a lot more attention in the next quarter, hoping for you know, more revenue expansion with this, that SaaS, mod, SaaS offering. You know, you know what I'd like to, and we don't have a lot of time now, but maybe, you know, in, in the research group, um, actually, let me just uh, remind people here. Uh, if you are a VIP member, you'll have access to the Matterport research group and TTR research group. But, you know, I, I'm a, I, I don't understand the other use cases that much because 
real estate seems a little bit niche to me, especially with all, all the competition that they have these 3D tools. You mentioned something earlier about like uh, analysis of how many, you know, Southern facing windows in a city, something like that. It, it seemed like there are other applications beyond real estate that might seem like much bigger TAMs and, and potentially less competition uh, because they may be more advanced uh, than their competition to be able to go into these other spaces. Seemed like there was something there. I don't fully get it. Uh, I, I don't know if there's something you can add real quick before we move on regarding that. Yeah, so it's only mentioned by the CEO what are their ex what existing use cases they could bring about. So he mentions in one of the examples that, hey, you know, if there's someone wants how many southern facing windows are there in London in in apartments in London in a community. They could do that with if every house is captured by by Metaport in spatial design. They could they could just run this analysis in a couple of minutes, do all sorts of algorithms about you know how much energy can be saved with the solar power, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. So basically he tells that this is a lot of like data play. They have so much data on the spatial places. And you can use that data in many, many different ways. He, he talks about you know, an operations manager at a retail store, just trying, he, he can actually just change the aisle settings, sitting in a remote location. He doesn't even have to be in a- You, in, you, know, what in, this, in a, you know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of when Google, for Google Maps started, they put cameras on top of their cars and they were taking pictures of all the streets and they put satellites in the skies and they're taking pictures of everything, you know, for the Google Maps. And everyone thought like they're crazy. Why are they spending so much money? Um, it's an interesting parallel there. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll dig a little more deep on this data uh, stuff and uh, try and put my thoughts on the group. But they do mention a lot of use cases apart from real estate. And I think this, mm -hmm. this talk is also looking towards that too, right? Like mm -hmm. the. All right, cool. Thank you so much, Akil, for that presentation. We'll collaborate with you in the MTTR research group. Uh, we got <laughs> plenty of events coming up. Actually, you know what? Like our events on the, uh, the website, we're a little bit behind. We're not totally caught up on it. So, but we put them into that VIP community, the WhatsApp. Um, we have the CEO, CFO of Augmetics uh, VIP pick uh, that was chosen by James Ticknor. CFO is coming this Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. during our happy hour slot. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we got three Twitter space events every week. So you can follow us on Twitter and uh, YouTube, see what's going on there. We got tons of video and content coming out on our YouTube channel. So with that, I want to thank everyone for their uh, participation here. We're going to end the recording and go on to our trade of the week. Thank you, everyone.